So hello everybody, my name is Hedayat and it is another session of Holochain in Action. Holochain in Action is a virtual, mostly weekly meeting held by Holochain community members. So we are gathering here, we share our knowledge, we review the project which build based on the Holochain and review the patterns, anything mostly uh, technically about Holochain. So if you have any feedback, please deliver in the description. If you would like to participate in these meetings, actually, you need to fill out the application form, go to the description or forum.holochain.org. You can find the section. You need to fill out the application form, especially if you are from other communities with other projects and would, would like to communicate, to correlate, to implement something the same with Holochain and so on and so forth, a warm welcome, especially if you are technical or developer. So that being said, this session is about a review or better to say a technical deep dive part two on ACORN project. What is ACORN project? The project is a collaboration open source peer-to-peer -peer distributed collaboration app based on the Holochain architecture and uh, implemented by Connor. So uh, thank you for all my friends here that join again and Connor and especially another one, Guillaume Cordoba, who is going to drive today's session with the code review. And if you didn't watch the previous video, please go to the part one. Part one about this technical deep dive on ACOR. It was about architect and design of ACOR. So we review everything, how the skeleton of the project is, how ACOR architect and design. This session, we are going to deep dive in a code about the layers in, in um, validation rules as anything that uh, Connor implemented for uh, ACON as much as possible. So that being said, I can say thank you, Connor. Thank you, Gilem and others who joined today. Connor, if you would like to say something to a start, please, and then we can go to Guillaume and Guillaume is going to drive the session. Or just one thing about um, the introduction to Acorn. So um, uh, I do kind of like the, there's parts of the coding that I do, and then there's parts that I don't do. And and I just want to uh, shout out shout out to my partner Pega um, in um, Trillo, uh and Life, and um, and we uh, work together on it. And she. Um, does all of the design work and as well as a lot of the implementation of the the um, all the kind of stylistic aspects of the front end are primarily um, are primarily her work and so she gets in on that um, all of that as well doing a lot of the CSS some of the JavaScript front end um, stuff all that kind of thing so I'm here showing you about one one part of it and uh, if there was, if we were ever to like focus on that part of it, that would be like, uh, that would be her show. So, um, just like, uh, yeah, giving acknowledgement. Other than that, yeah. Um, okay, there. Thank you. That's it. I would like to say, Gm, it is you, and we are hearing and following you. Cool. Okay, yeah, thanks, Connor, for that. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't like to set uh, much context today because, uh, like, uh, I, I assume uh, everyone watching will have uh, watched from the first video. I do want to give space if someone has any questions or doubts or you can or want to comment uh, around the what we did on the first part, which is uh, more of the scaffold or the structure. Ayakup. Uh, the structure uh, around the electron and the wrapper of the halogen conductor, all that structure, because uh, once we have that cleared out, I would like to dive, dive into what's halogen code uh, today and, and also UI, a bit of UI uh, state design and things like that. So 
in short, does anyone have any questions about last session or can we get into these other parts? Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, can I can I, yeah, go ahead. can I go for a really quick review of architect to fresh the mind and you can just one minute or 30 seconds? Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. You can. good. I have yeah. something to add to that as well. Uh -huh, the timing also really quick from me. If it is better that you can go and review and watch the whole last video, it means part one. I think it was Holochain in action 13. The, but just for the quick review, generally it was the way that the Holochain conductor fundamentally is working. You can, you can in your conductor, which is a part of a one important part of the Holochain architecture that it is coming up, bringing up and do all the required or necessary job behind the scene or better to say in, in a subconscious le level, it is propagating data, connecting. So mostly the things are working in that way. You can have a different cell inside a cell. You can install a DNA with a one public key, one pair key, public key, private key. So it means you have a different cell and you it is different application. It is the way that normally Holochain application are working, but as we explained, Acorn Architect has totally different or not different following this pattern that in the Acorn, we have a one profile DNA. Generally, we have two DNAs. The first one, a profile DNA. So when you bring up your application, which is um, electron application, we reviewed everything in detail and again today. So the profile DNA is gonna come up. People are gonna meet each other and then two people, like this one and this one can create a project, just generate a new DNA or clone a DNA, which is another nice pattern. As a project DNA, they can connect each other, they can chat. And for this one, one new cell is going to be started. So it means new project, new cell, clone a project DNA. Mostly there are two DNA profile, people seeing each other, project, people connect to each other based on a one project. And at the end, electron is gonna come up inside the electron, there is a UI, they connect to each other. This electron part is coming to bring up a conductor just to connect to conductor and so on and so forth. That's it, it is a really cool, quick review about the whole architect. Thank you. I, I have one, one thing to add to that, which I shared in the channel since our last call and I, I won't describe it in detail now what I'll do is I'll just fold it up to the to the screen if that works and then people can pause the video to look at it um, let's see if we can get this uh, in view here and just as a quick summary of what it means uh, you've got electron which opens up um, a splash window as well as eventually a main window and this outlines the process of how the electron main thread um, uh, goes from launching the splash window to launching layer key store, private keys, uh, to launching Holochain conductor, running it in the background. And, um, and once the Holochain conductor is ready, then it opens the main, uh, the main window instead of the splash window. So, uh, you know, that can be paused and um, uh, nice, thanks for that, yeah. That can be reviewed. Onward. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Connor and, and Hedayat. Um, at any point in time, uh, just stop me. I have uh, maybe the tendency sometimes to go too fast. So please, please uh, stop me, um, uh, Connor, or anyone else that has uh, any question. Um, because I missed something or whatever. So what I want to do is uh, like share the screen and go into the code. I haven't reviewed the code uh, deeply. Um, so I'm, I'm just, uh, if, for, for, for the context, I'm just going at it after watching uh, last session's video. And in general, what I want to do is, is first review a bit the backend code with the zones, the way the DNA uh, DNAs integrate with each other. And then I would also want to focus on how the UI does state management. 
uh, particular because that that particular that has particular interest to to me. I think it's a crucial point in 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 UI applications. So, okay, can you see my screen? Yes, cool. clearly. Okay. So, um, this is the Acon repository, just cloned uh, from. Well, not just cloned. I, I had it cloned, but um, anyway, uh, this uh, this is what what you get what you get when you clone Acon. So, I'm going to focus first on the backend code, which is in DNA. If I'm not uh, wrong, well, the backend. Sorry, because. In Acorn, you also have the conductor with which with the embedded holochain uh, runner. So uh, what I mean is that I'm going to focus on the DNAs, right, on the on, on the hub. Uh -huh. So we have here, uh, like this looks uh, really familiar with the you have your zones and you have your work there. There is this uh, OK, yeah. Um, this this uh, rings a bell also. Um, so um, this is a, a help crate that I guess you are uh, pulling from these uh, other zones, right? That's Am I right. right about that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so if I shared, go here, shared code, yeah, for yeah, the zones. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Ooh, okay. So this this seems to be yeah. Ha! Huh. You seem to have uh, somehow abstracted uh, create, update, delete. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. a fun that's a fun thing to come back to later. The um the okay. create update delete because it relates to um in a way state management in the UI, but also like signaling it well essentially signaling it facilitates signaling and state management in the um in the UI and distinguishes between different types of actions at a general level. Nice. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then what I'm going to do is not start yeah. from the abstract. I'm going to start to start from the concrete, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from the actual zones. Go mm -hmm. ahead. Uh, what can you explain state management? What do you manage in the UI? What does it mean, state management? Mm. Can you? Yeah. Ah, was was that for me or for or for for Connor? Like both, a... and it is the question. For, what for do you mean? What 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 does mean a create update delete or if, what, if there any state management? What does it mean generally? Oh, yeah. Well, let's say you're just in the user interface and you're trying to track. Um, um, you're trying to synchronize information in your user interface with how that information appears in the in the DHT. So uh, either through call and response through making zoom calls and like looking at data and then updating it locally or maybe by receiving signals and um and uh, updating your local or client version of the state that way so it, it yeah it mostly relates to how does uh, a ui or a client um receive um and synchronize itself with the with the dht or yeah the general data in the dht that is great. Thank you. It means in a UI, we can keep one object aligned with the, the, the object and a DHT and keep both of them updated. If there is any change in exactly. other, other agents make a change on the entry on the DHT, my uh -huh. UI can immediately or with a little bit delay, I can be notified. I can change the state to the latest version of a DHT. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Mm. Um, I would add to that that uh, it's really good also for sharing state between components. So um, e the the web development of today is largely based on web components. So you have like a, um, I don't know a projects component that has to render your project, but the information of that uh, component um, is the same information that another component uh, needs because the profile information is also shared. So if you download only once the information about the profiles, then you can share it across your components and you can be much more performant and, and smart that way. Cool, cool. Yeah. So um, as I said, I'm not going to start with this. I'm going to start with profiles, which I think should be the easiest to start with. So. Yeah. Let's see. So first, I'm going to go to the cargo tunnel. Okay. So here, 
Huh. Okay. So you're pinning a, a specific uh, Holochain version. Interesting. Yeah, those, have since, those have since uh, been merged. So that's that's quite that's quite dated, and those have since been merged. But it's still pointing at that. Um, okay. It's it's basically in the main branch now too. It's nothing special, basically. Is what I'm saying. Cool. Oh, okay. And then this this is what is interesting me. I don't think I have seen this yet. Uh, you have Holochain types, which I know is one of the crates from Holochain Core in the dev dependencies. Um, are you using this for maybe testing unit testing the code? Oh, yeah, that's the... right. Wow. Yeah, okay. that's probably that's... why. That's why that's in there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let me let me uh, um, review that when we get there. So okay. Mm -hmm. um, for for the most part, this looks. So right. uh, again, it means yeah. uh, using this one, we can in the DHT we can implement unit testing. Exactly. Yes, that's but I, I I I want to get into how the unit testing looks when we get there. For the sure, I just wanted to clear it. That's yeah, it. Yeah, Before yeah. It, it means generally interestingly that in the DHT level we can implement unit tests. Thank you. In yeah, the DHT, also, in, in mo it's, it's more the DNA level. DNA. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. And um, just that there's no. That's probably actually unnecessary because there's no unit tests in the profile zone. They're all in the projects uh -huh. zone because it was the, it's just slightly incomplete. Sure, sure. Okay, so let's review, uh, let's dive into the code for profiles. Okay, so very simple zone, just two files, lib, and you have profile module with a, with a mod there. Um, Okay, so let's see. You are defining. Uh, this is what uh, one of the first thing I look for: the entry definition in a in a zone. You are defining a path, uh, which is uh, one of the things that you get for free from the HDK, and mm -hmm. you are also defining a profile entry. So mm -hmm. let's go here first, and then I'm 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 going to review the init. The init. I want to to clarify first the the entries. Mm -hmm. So this is how a profile entry looks like. And um, okay, do you have anything interesting here, Connor? Um, the address, okay. mm -hmm. the address points to the public key of the mm -hmm. of the agent who this is a profile for, um, and. Um, is imported just relates to the fact that we've been enabling you to import old projects, um, which means that you actually have to even create profiles for people who are purely imported, meaning they didn't create their own profile. Um, they're basically their profile is sort of, we call it the ghost because it's um, because you've brought in someone and you kind of want to represent them in the DHT, uh, but they were imported. It, um, can be gone back to if we ever get to importing, but um, it's just like a flag. Interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. interesting, interesting, really interesting. Um, yeah, so I guess this, um, this implies, like putting the, the public key inside the profile implies that you are solving the uniqueness. Oh, no, it doesn't imply that. Okay, yeah, let me let me review a bit more. So uh, a profile struct, first name, last name, a handle, which is like nickname or, or whatever, mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. avatar. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious, where do you store the avatar or is it? Nowhere, it's just, um, so there's no file management right now. So that's something a potential upgrade would mm -hmm. be like integrating some image handling because you just have to have a hosted um image yeah okay and one day one day we were trying to use it offline and it felt really broken and we were like why does the app feel broken and then we realized we didn't have internet connectivity and people's nice. avatars weren't showing um and it was an interesting reminder of that nice okay okay cool um another pattern uh i've i've used is also putting like uh, we don't care about file storage yet so we crop the image and we put it as a string like it just inside mm. the, the profile um, mm -hmm. strand. Mm. Um, yeah okay so and 
now yeah yes. would you please also review a status what what, what is a status for uh, oh yeah that's and, just and that's whether to... someone states themselves as being online offline or away or something along those lines it's kind mm -hmm. of like the idea of someone's um like for example in slack you can kind of see someone's um indicator uh status and uh -huh. so it actually just updates mm. yeah it is online away offline yeah um i think cool. it's supposed to be used for the synchronized chat that you showed us that you are going two person can chat because what where do you use it what was the reason that show mm. i'm online or offline what is the benefit actually it's a little bit more uh future future proofing it's um it's not fully implemented in the ui yet so it's kind of like data that's around and you can change it but it doesn't reflect anywhere significant in the user interface okay so and is the idea that if i go online i should update my profile to reflect that uh doesn't matter we're kind of debating that ourselves okay um, okay interesting yeah that's fine Okay, so let me just review a bit more. I want to find, uh, so this is like conversion tracks, mostly for input output yeah. serialization. Yeah. I want to find, um, exactly, exactly. This is yeah. like after, after, after uh, my process is first seeing what entries are there and then when you create each type of entry, what happens, right? Mm -hmm. So um, if I get this right, you call this create who am I with an already constructed profile and then you link it. Okay, interesting. So you link it from, from two places, from a path and an entry hash. Mm -hmm. Okay, what's, what, can, can you tell us a bit about the difference and what are you using each one uh, for? Mm -hmm. um, the, the second one uh, with line 126 says list me so I can specifically and quickly look up my profile. So it's for a user to just um, uh -huh. quickly fetch their own profile since they already know their own public key. So then they can fetch their own profile without doing a, uh, without doing a full um, list retrieval. But then you can also call basically the full list. So list me so anyone can see my profile is the first one. So it's at a path that's known globally to all the participants, um, meaning they could fetch that. Agent's path is just at the top of the file, I think. And um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so it's just a global, a global string type path that means that everyone can find uh, my profile as well as me quickly finding my own. That's the purpose of those two links that are getting created there. Mm, awesome, just, just, just to clarify for, for everyone as well. So, um, here we are creating only one entry, but we are uh, linking from two other entries. Um, we are creating the profile entry, and then the easiest maybe is uh, um, linking from my uh, from from the agent public key of the agent that created it, so that I can go get my profile right because I know my public key, and the other one is to a global path entry. So only one of these path entry exists, but all the profiles that are being created uh, have a link attached from that path. So you can go get all the profiles or something like that. Is that right, Connor? Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, and I have, I, a, yeah, yeah, go. I have a question. It means the second links, it, it's telling me that there is a possibility for each agent to have a multi-profile. Mm. Um, no, not necessarily, or at least that's not the intended design or purpose. The intended purpose is so that I, as an agent, can quickly look up my own profile. Um, by knowing my own public key, uh, I can quickly do a get links call for the get links that are linked to my public key, and I'll get back my profile. Um, so it's like a quick lookup for uh, my personal profile. Mm -hmm. I, it means it is a redundancy for a performance because anytime yeah. I come up, I can easily and quickly fetch my profile. That's yeah. it. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Nice pattern. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't think about. It. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there is there is something cool with this also, which like not not also, but to clarify a bit more, which is um, in the DHT, like you all know that uh, not all the agents are holding all the entries, right? So maybe some agents are holding the path entry, this this one, and maybe some others are not, right? But the um, agent public key entry so whenever an agent comes online it creates an entry with its public key in the dht this entry will always be stored like the neighborhood of this entry will have the agent the author of that entry in it right is is this what what's uh, what you are using as a, an assumption connor so mm. bas basically this link will be held always by the uh, author of the profile. And so the get, get links from this uh, hash never has to leave the author, the node. That's, like prob you, you that's probably true. That's probably true. I can't say for sure. And I hadn't, I hadn't baked it in uh, super consciously with that assumption, but, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm following you and thinking that that's true and probably not worth spending too much time on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I have a question here, which is, um, like, did you, did you think about, um, using the create link from your public key versus querying your source chain? And did you choose this path, um, for some, uh, special reason? Oh, right. So yeah, you could just look it up um, on your source chain. No, I don't think I don't think I I don't think it's matters like that might be a more performant way to do it. So that might be better. Hmm. Mm. Well, it's like mm -hmm. for, for, for me, it's interesting because this has also um, like in the future, if I want to know your profile, I have a link there that I could look up if I know your your public key, for example. So, right, it, yeah. like the different patterns yeah. you can you can just have different implications. So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, cool. Um, uh, any questions about this function, which is I guess the main one? I I want to find the get profiles uh, function. But any questions anyone has about this? Any comments? Well, this, the second half there is just like sending a signal to peers mm. to basically announce yourself. Um, to nice. announce yourself like to the to the uh, to all the peers. So, um, so that's kind of important and kind of fun just because it's like they realize right away. It doesn't do anything in their user interface, but essentially mm -hmm. they end up they end up with your profile sort of sitting in even in their their local you know their local state. They end up with your profile sitting there, ready to go when they join your project or that kind of thing. That's really nice. And so, if I if I understand you correctly, this mm -hmm. is going to get all profiles. Get yes, yeah. exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it 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 looks. And it's it's not doing anything like it's doing kind of a dumb lookup of of mm -hmm. peers just saying like everybody um, everybody who's um, announced themselves uh, in this um, or who's yeah who's who's uh, record I can see as having I think created a profile um, then uh, then send them send them a remote signal so send them a message containing my profile um so that's how i sort of do a broadcast announcement to all the acorn people um if they happen to be online and listening uh to to know about me i'm a new i'm a new player yeah that's and really interesting there'll, um, there'll be lots of other like cases of like using signals that we can kind of look at and i reuse this pattern of just calling get peers which is like just like pulling up all that the kind of list of people to send the message to and stuff like that. Well, it's, it's, it's right there, but I, I feel like you would want to go into it specifically with that as a focus rather than as a, as a, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, no, I, I, I was just going to point out uh, this, that you have basically generalized this pattern 
and say, um, hey, these are the list of signals that I want to broadcast to be able to broadcast to everybody at any point in time. So like as you saw here, broadcasting something is really easy now. Mm -hmm. I really like this pattern. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, cool. So um, did you did you say that it would be interesting to look at the different agent signals that can be broadcasted, Connor? Yeah, okay. Um, well, yeah, at least here's an example of, of mm -hmm. um, this idea of um, distinguishing at a generalized level between different types of actions that can happen on entries. So I, I found it useful just as a, as a take a step back for a moment. I found it useful to um, create consistent patterns of how, um, of how entries look, of how data structures look essentially at the level of data being passed over the wire between peers or, or to the UI. So, so for example, anywhere that you see in the code, the word wire entry, um, there's kind of a, a typicalized um, uh, pattern at least of having a thing with an entry and an address and the address mm -hmm. is a wrapped header hash and the entry contents might differ. So in this case, it's a profile, but in another case, it'll be a different data structure, but it'll be under entry. And there's another thing called address, which is the wrapped header hash. And so it's just, um, it's kind of wire entry makes it really explicit, like this idea. I've 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 just kind of popped out a data structure that is really optimized for um, uh, in particular passing information to the to a user interface. Um, wire entry, it's okay for serializing to peers, but in particular, it's good for serializing and sending to the user interface, um, just because the user interface has special requirements like it would rather see things as strings than buffers and stuff like that so um so that's why we create this consistent thing called the wire entry and then um we use that and then there's also something consistent about there's only three basic data um action types within holochain right of that occur on an entry there are create an update and a delete and so i made one signal um, signal structure um, that this action type thing that we talked about. Yeah, create, update, delete. It's just kind of distinguishing at that most general level. Okay, if I'm a create, I'm gonna pass you, you know, the data that relates to a create, I'm gonna pass you an entry and an address. And if I'm an update, I'm gonna do the same thing. Uh, if I'm a delete, then I'm going to pass you an address of something I deleted, but not the contents because it's a delete. So there's this general um, approach to specifying this. It, I feel like I'm talking a little in the abstract at this point, so I kind of should go back to what, what we were looking at um, the, um, with the, the send agent signal for the profile, where we said it just makes it clear in the particular case that this was a create entry. And so we specify action, action type create. So, you know, if it was, if, if this, if I was in the context of an update and I was trying to send a signal out to people, I would use action type update instead. Mm -hmm. That's bottom line. Um, and then there's the contents that an action type create expects. Um, but that's kind of, that's very detail oriented stuff that we could yeah look at later mm -hmm, mm -hmm. no but that's that's great um you yeah one question pops up with that which is um you you aren't saying that you aren't you are notifying everyone all the time of all the things that happens that happen in, in the back end it's just that you have created like a a common pipeline to be able to do so when it's necessary am i right about that in a sense, it doesn't relate to who calls what with what information. It's more, it's more a consistent data structure so that as a user interface yeah, yeah. or as a client, I, I know what to expect when I receive a signal um, from, uh, from the conductor. I know how to parse it and kind of handle 
um, handle that signal uh, in order to like do that whole piece that we talked about of the up the UI state management. So it'll it'll kind of fall into place and fall into context if you saw, if uh, if we were to see it in the context of the, the user interface that receives um, a signal that looks like this. Not that in this case it sends it to the to the UI. It sends it. Mm -hmm. Well, it, yeah, it does. But yeah, yeah, right, right. And I do want to point out that Connor was, uh, I think, the first one to start using these kinds of uh, wrapped header hash. Um, this uh, this is really just like a header hash, exactly like a header hash, but on the UI side, it gets converted to a string, uh, right? So um, if you like in, in, in the UI, if you want to compare IDs, if you want to do whatever, it's much better to work with strings and than, than, than it is to uh, with binary arrays, which is what you get with uh, header hash and so on. And I think mm -hmm. it's fair to say that you have been like the 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 culprit of spreading this pattern. And now <laughs> I, I like I guess everyone is using it. So this is this or uh, now you also can 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 see this. This is immensely yeah. common in, in yeah. hub development. I'm looking forward to just switching to that given that it's I mean I guess it doesn't make a huge difference, but but yeah, the general idea um, it did because I was just well. Basically, I would have had to little backstory here. I would have had to refactor massive, enormous amounts of user interface code um, uh, for Acorn when these changes from Holochain Rust uh, version of Holochain to Holochain RSM version came came through. So. So the, the, basically the change was, was going to be a huge, massive breaking change. And I would have had to spend days refactoring um, the user interface. So basically I had a huge incentive to come up with a solution. Um, and that's why I came up with, um, with a pattern for handling um, the conversion to and from the binary arrays of header hashes to um, to strings on the on the DNA side instead of on the on the client side, but yeah, for most people it'll be just generally useful, generally helpful, um, and there's an article on it or something along those lines that we can point to, so um, we don't need to spend too long. Perfect, perfect, cool. Um, props for that, Connor. Yeah, that's, thanks. That thanks. was uh, really nice. Um, I want to reveal like the other uh, important. Do, 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 do. Okay, yeah. So here we have the like we saw the create uh, functions. Here is uh, uh, the, uh, the, we can see the read functions. So um, as uh, as we saw before, the create had two links: one for the agent public key and one for uh, a generalized path, like a unique mm -hmm. path that everyone can can uh, look at, and here, like we can see exactly the difference. Fetch all agents, like with all of the profiles, fetches the links uh, from that unique path entry, and who am I? Fetches the links from the uh, agent public key of the agent that's that's calling it. So that's perfectly clear. The only uh, thing that is interesting to me is get latest for entry, which. I guess is a way of uh, going through all the update chain that this profile has gone through. Right, right. Exactly, right. Right. Um, okay, um, I, I, I want to pause a bit there and I want to make sure that uh, everyone is on the page, same page and, and give a bit space if anyone has any questions uh, on these uh, profiles, Zoom. Uh, that we reviewed, like I, th I think we repeat the most important part, Connor. If you have anything else yeah, that's, that, that that you think is relevant, so does anyone uh, have any 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 question around this, or or comment, or or like, oh, that's a cool pattern, whatever. So, question that um, the same the. We can have a duplicated profile ID, yes. Mm -hmm. So it means the uniqueness is 
not there. So the people are supposed to identify themselves with, with, with somehow with telephone or something, with email, with the profile, some, some, somehow with something. So uh, we already- What was that? What did you mean? Then you, I mean, if there are a 5GM Cordoba or a GM inside, I need to find it out by myself, which one mm. is the real GM Cordoba. It means by reading, by telephone, human being, totally true. true. Totally. Yeah, yeah um, that would be true. Mm -hmm. So- What's your not, public key, man? <laughs> <laughs> Read all your 50-something <laughs> So another one about the signaling, when, when the signal, mm -hmm. you are supposed to send a signal, it is sending signal to all agent, to live agent, to who are the receivers of the signal. It would be anyone who's listed their profile um, mm -hmm. with the caveat that, of course, only people, it's called what they, they, they keep describing it as a fire and forget. So basically it just sends, it tries to send a signal to all of those peers. And if those peers have, you have no connectivity to them, then it just forgets about it and it, it has no impact. It reaches whoever is reachable at the, at the, at the time at which it tries to, to send the signal. So, so it will try to send to everyone um, who is using the same DNA, the same version of profiles that you are. So if you were using the same version of Acorn, then you would, uh, they would technically send all of those people in particular because they would be the ones who are on your same, um, who share your, your DHT. Thank you. So mm -hmm. that, that, that is to, to both DM and you. If, is there anything also in a test? Is there anything that we can review in the test section? Test profile not, section. Not in there. Test, integration test anything. Oh yeah, it, not in this particular zone. There isn't, uh, except that there's. Oh, there would be a thing in. Oh no, I got rid of. I got rid of my trirama tests. So the trirama tests aren't there. So, but um, Jakob. Yeah, just a detailed question, um, like small detail. Um, so I noticed in some functions that uh, you are in the signature, you are using, instead of empty brackets, you are using the underscore uh, colon empty brackets. Um, and I'm not familiar with this pattern. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, this one. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So that's to do with um, if you're defining a zone, uh, a zone function, um, it's to do with the fact that it, it needs uh, it needs to accept one argument and it needs to return one argument. And so uh, you can make it accept an empty, um, basically the unit type as the argument, which means that from the UI side, you're not gonna have to pass anything, um, I believe is, is true to say, mm -hmm. um, but I don't believe that you can leave it empty. Um, yeah, you, you can't, which is sort of a, a bizarre thing relating to just using HDK extern and thinking through the model of how data is passed between um, a HAP on the inside and a client on the, on the outside. It needs to deserialize into something, even if that deserializing into is the unit type, which is like nil or whatever. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. And the awesome. underscore is just like an unused variable name, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, perfect. Um, before going into the projects, uh, so because this mm, can yeah. take a, a while. Yeah, I was going to check in about the time. We can do, um, we can do like 20 minutes, 20 minutes from now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, I think you missed in it. Let's go to in it. Fine. I'm looking cool. forward to in it. Sure. Um, okay. So interestingly, in it. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> so since uh, the the uh, there is one global path, we are creating it in in it. So we make sure that. Uh, it exists before actually starting to, to create profiles and so on. 
And then I'm curious, let's see if create receive signal brand. Uh, again, uh, oh. I, I would like to ask at first, Connor, what, what is the init for? Why you are using init and what is the flow? What is the architect? What is the design? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, it's basically just two things that have to happen in init. Um, and for those who don't know, I guess init gets called on the first, uh, at the moment of the first call um, to the zone. So, um, so uh, which I only kind of learned recently, or maybe it changed or something. Um, but uh, this is kind of interesting because a um, little like, tiny little tangent here was that I realized that the first time that I went to try like in the user interface to, to create something like a goal, um, <clears throat> the first time would take longer than the second time. Um, and it used to be worse. Um, it used to be like, I was like, what's happening? Cause the first time took like six seconds. And then I had to refactor it to, um, I realized what I, that I had to do some refactoring, uh, but it was because it calls in it on the first time. So calling path from agents path .insure actually takes time because it's making it's it's making a commit. And maybe it was just at the time, but that that particular function call was pretty slow. Um, I don't know if other people have noticed that, um, but it basically it creates that idea of the anchor that I think you've talked about before to. Um, is they hang all the other or link all the other uh, profiles off of. So it's a it's a fixed path. It knows um, it's a fixed entry in the DHT to which you're going to link all people's profiles so that you can just get them all back um, by doing a get links call. So that's the classic path, and you just call it during a knit. There's other places and times you could call that, but this is fine. And then. Um, also, if you're going to do peer-to-peer -peer remote signal, then you need um, a signal cap grant. So um, it's basically a way of um, declaring uh, within your context by writing an entry to your source chain that you are going to allow people to call uh, you remote signal. It's kind of like listing your phone number somewhere um, such that you can, um, you say, I'm available to call at um, this number. I'm, I won't block you. I won't, uh, I'll receive your calls. So you commit this entry specifically for this. Uh, it's not as encoded as it should be that, because it's just like a random string name, but it is actually like an expected hook. Uh, from from Holochain called receive RECV remote signal. And you need to specifically use that function name uh, and define that function in order to actually receive remote signals. So it's not poorly named, but um, so you say, I allow anyone, oh, empty access line 131 is important. Empty access, the unit type, the unit type is the empty brackets. Empty access converts to unrestricted. So that means anybody can call. Um, anybody can call this number. I won't block, I won't block anybody. Hmm. Yeah, and, and for, for those uh, listening, uh, capability tokens work uh, in negative, in a negative way in Holochain. So you cannot call any function of any agent, unless you have uh, given the capability token to, to do so, right? So if you don't commit this, you won't actually be able to, to call it. And I'm guessing, yes, exactly. So you're declaring it here in the in the mod. Uh, yeah, that's I, right. So that, that, that's where we actually receive it and we just forward it to the UI. That way it should, uh, it does say that in the comment above, but could say that with emit signal. It's kind of a classic pattern that we're seeing like emerge in Holochain is like this very thin wrapper that basically just takes in a remote signal from a peer uh, that's coming in from Holochain uh, conductors and all of its subconscious. And then it just says immediately, uh, I mean, it decodes it in this case, um, but then it just forwards it to the uh, to the user interface via emit signal. So 
it can be a bit confusing to have signals being talking about both things, but I think you've talked about that before in, in the calls and um, uh, emit signal goes to the UI and receive remote signals from the peer, so. Yes, we already talked about both signal and a kizona. I think part number mm -hmm. three, if anybody would like to see what's happening, mm -hmm. what's the best place. Also in the in the subnet, you can also they can also. Mm -hmm. So generally, to 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 sum up, do you, uh, before anything, Guillaume, would you do you have anything? Would you like to talk about the init function at all? The whole init function. Any remain that, point? Think... Any remain knowledge you would like to share? I think Connor did a great job in that. That is great. So it means, uh, Connor, for the, you decided to do two things in the init function. One of them, it is a path because it takes time. So you, you prefer that the user is gonna be waiting for a couple of seconds during the process of in initialization of the application rather than any time just calling this one. This is really a small. The second one is a capability token, and you are supposed to put it as a grant, actually. Mm -hmm. Again, we already discussed, but a quick, quick review. What is a capability token? In the centralized architect, you, for sure, you have heard about the JW token or JSON web token. So it means there is a central or a single source of trust generating token for you, saving in, in their own databases. As, and other times you are supposed to bring back the token that you have for calling any services or anything or API. So they are gonna compare your token with the token in their database and the doors are gonna be open for you. You can use API. In the distributed peer-to-peer -peer architect like Holochain, we don't have any central single source. It means if I'm supposed to call something on your client as a peer, you need to give me grant. You need to give me something, the token. The whole story goes to the capability token. That's it, really easy. Mm -hmm. So- There's also one, one element to it, which is that you can just make it permissionless so you can declare it's permissionless so you instead of someone needing to have something like a token to call it you can just say nobody needs anything anybody it's a free-for-all here so um so anybody can call so that's the idea of the unrestricted um nobody ah. needs any any token i've created the cap grant so i'm creating the i'm i'm granting access to anybody without anything without needing to pass anything but there's also the ones that you're talking about hadaya which is mm -hmm. the ones with a token where i would need to send them a token they would need to call me with that token in order for the doors to be open as you said yeah that's great it means you grant a capability token architect but you put it as a public it means anybody can come i already grant the permission as a public call anybody can call mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so and you decided to put both of them in init that you can finish it and the, 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 for the future. That is great mm -hmm. and totally smart. Thank you. I just wanted to, to actually summarize the whole thing that yeah. I got for that. That's it. Thank you. Perfect. So should we go and have a quick review because we haven't got time to have a very, very in-depth one uh, of the uh, project zones. Okay, let's go. So cargo thermal looks exactly the same as the other as the other one. And remember, uh, everyone uh, watching, that here we are entering into another DNA altogether. So profiles, it's its own DNA, and now we are entering in the projects DNA. You can see them both here, built side by side. So it's not. Uh, a sibling zone in the sense that uh, mm. you, you you may see other applications having uh, zones like like this packaged into one DNA. In this case, it's packaged into two separate DNAs. That's a good point and could be a, a folder structure uh, clarity thing. Yeah, and I, I think I think it's it's perfectly cool. Just just uh, I think to to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Cool, so let's dive in. Uh, yeah, just starting, you can already see that this is going to be uh, like big and interesting. Mm -hmm. So 
Okay, reviewing the entry definitions here. So we have path. Yeah, yeah, go. You, you don't need, to, yeah, so this will be cool. You don't need to go through them one by one, but we can kind of just, um, I can give you the very high level looking at this, which Perfect. is that, um, which is that a goal is the main thing. So picture like a Trello card, um, picture a Trello card. It's essentially that. Now, um, now these Trello cards, these, these goals are linked to each other with things that we call edges. And we didn't use links. We, uh, in tr intrinsic data structures, we, we defined an, an explicit data structure called an edge, which creates, uh, which creates the, the relationship between two goals. If you've seen Acorn visually, then you know that they're, they're linked with lines and those lines are what we call edges. Yeah, Hadayat? Connor, would you like to share your screen? Because if you are going to have a quick review of this one, mm. if you would like, you can go for your share a screen and ch 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 quickly, if mm. I just wanted to suggest, yeah. you share, change the share screen from GM to you, if you would uh -huh. like, to, because of the time you would like to go to quick review. We can. I could, I don't think I need to. I'll just, I'll just say kind of um, how they, how they work roughly. So goals which are on line 33, are related by edges, which are on line 31. Um, and uh, goals have um, a couple of different uh, things that can kind of be related to them. Those things are goal comments, goal members, and goal votes. So those all are kind of like, for example, assignees, um, votes are like just kind of um, how important is this and comment, comments are just comments da, 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 da. Uh, hey 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 how are things um, and then um, entry point uh, is also just kind of like metadata on a goal um, defined separately and the last two um, that aren't path which is like uh, we know about path are member and project meta and member um, member are just a very, very simple one. People kind of writing their own agent pub keys to the DHT saying, I'm here. Um, and project meta is basically project metadata. So we're looking at the metadata for the project. What is the project name? What is the project description? What is the project image? And also what is the project secret phrase? So all of those things are in project meta. So that's the quick quick tour of what those are. Yeah, yeah, thanks. And a quick review about init, what's happening inside init. Yeah, uh, the same cap grant, um, it, that inside it looks exactly the same as profiles. Um, and then we have join project during init, you can hop to it quickly. Uh, no way. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, oh. I don't have the rasterizer. Oh coolness oh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. okay um it just writes its own the, a, a member who's just joined the dht writes their own public key to the dht just to announce uh in a persistent way that they've joined so that um basically we can look up our fellow peers who share our project by their profile uh, via their public key, which they've listed in the in the DHT. Cool. So um, yeah, this is uh, somewhat resembling this the pattern that you have in profiles to get all the all the peers, but in in this case, it's the the members of this project. And remember, mm -hmm. this this project's DNA is going to be cloned every time, every project. So how uh, how how are, how are many however many projects you are inside you will be creating a new members entry in each of them and mm -hmm. it, uh, in, in 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 this way if i'm in a project with hedayat and connor and i get all the members i'm going to get only the members of this project and not all the other projects dnas Mm -hmm. Yeah, would you please explain us what does it mean cloning DNA? What is the benefit and how we receive gen because the cloning DNA generally is a pattern. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and one of the greatest place that we have an example is here. Can you explain us 
a little bit briefly what is the pattern meaning, how it is working, how we can using and also this example. I think we still have a couple of minutes time to, to 20 minutes as panel. Right, right. I actually want to, if this is the case, I want to bring this up very quickly then. Okay, so cloning a DNA, so you know that, uh, you all know that the DNA is the um, application code, right? Uh, but a DNA, um, how, how do I say this? So in this case, for example, uh, we have a, an application which is a kind of similar in structure with Acon, right? So you have the open DNA in which everyone joins. This is the profiles DNA. And now in the, in the conductor, you can uh, select, for example, uh, Acorn. And I want to clone the private chat, which in Acorn's case would be the projects one, right? And if Abigail uh, clones this, and let's, I don't, I don't want to get deep into membrane proof now, but we, we can do this. And this is the field UID that you can change to create new DHTs, right? So from one DNA, you can create multiple DHTs that will work exactly the same, but maybe have different port properties or different UUID so that they, they are uh, not exactly the same DHT, right? So let's say that Abigail clones the private chat DNA, it's going to fork uh, herself into its own uh, DHT, right? And if you go to the cells, um, you can see that now Abigail has two cells. It, uh, he's, uh, she's uh, also playing on the bigger one, right? But also playing on the small one. And if, uh, oh, wait, and now I need to, okay. If Marilyn, for example, does exactly the same and clones the exact same DNA, so uh, the hash of the DNA plus the UID plus the properties is what identifies the DHT, right? So, uh, super secret code. So Marilyn is cloning the same code with the same UUID. So it's going to actually join Abigail in in their in in their in their uh, DHT, right? So now you have that every time that a member join, the network gets bigger and bigger. Um, but here we only have one project, right? So imagine Vicky wants to create her own project. So the same, let's clone a DNA, but now let's give it a different UID. Super secret code, it's the same. So now Biki is it's in, in its own project DNA, right? And it, it doesn't, uh, she doesn't, uh, she isn't in the same DNAs that Marily are, uh, Marily and Abigail are, right? So Marily and Abigail are in this uh, small one, and then Vicky is alone on her own, on her own nice. world. And, and, and Vicky could join, uh, other members could join, like you, you, can, you can imagine a lot of uh, playfulness here, nice. right? And a lot of different flexibility. Thanks, Gemma. So, yeah, um, thanks. Um, I, I wanted to like give a visual representation because, because it's difficult yeah, through it's the great. code. Um, and then like, you can, you can imagine that if we, have this project's DNA and we clone it again and again and again with different UUID, all of these will be the same functions, but with different edges, different goals, different, like um, imagine we have a project A, we are going to have the edges in that project A be different than the edges in project B, which is another DNA and another DHT altogether, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. In two minutes, that's what I could do, Hedayat. I, I hope that's done. Good. Amazing, I'm, I'm, I'm amazing. You had to that, but... <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> amazing, shout I said, out to you. I, I said, let's do 15 minutes more. Um, so. Yes, thank you. We have enough time, Guillaume. Yeah, I think another yeah. 15 minutes. Thank you, Kana. Yeah. So... Hedayat, um, I need one minute just to step away for a second. So just um, keep going uh, or whatever, whatever you want to do. I'll just be away for one minute and I'll be right back. That is great. Okay. So mm, about the cloning DNA, it was a great job. Thank you again. The things that you saw, guys, it was a whole change. Actually, I'm going to share the link. It is the tools that implemented by Gian. So you can go and practice. And that is great that you saw in action 
how the clone DNA is working. Go please and play with it personally and to test how the things are working. It's really rich tools. So if GM can also show in a YAML that we can see where the, what is the UUID, what does it mean? Yes, it is a UUID. Generally, as you can see, and we already explained in the previous videos, it is the manifest you need to create and combine different zone to generate the DNA. So based on this um, manifest and this information, at the end, you are supposed to have a web assembly, which is a binary with a code. If you do each and, which is in a hash, if you do each and every single changes here, the final result is going to be affected. So it is a hash, you know? So then there is the same code and you put the UUID as explained by GM number one, the hash is going to be changed. If you put, if for example, Alice put UUID number one, Bob put number one, both of them are gonna end it up with the same hash. They can easily see each other. They are going to be located inside the same DNA and the data is going to be shared between those two. It means Alice and Bob. The whole topic about architect of ACORN, that how the project, it means that people are gonna meet each other inside the profile to meet each other. Then two or three of them, it's going to be inside the one project. So do you remember they were supposed to put a phrases that I think GM is gonna show us where to put the phrases as a UID actually. Mm. So in the code, thank you GM. So people can put the same string. I can say, GM, I'm going to create a project. My phrase is number one, number two, three, four, five. If GM exactly put the same phrase, is supposed to end up with the same hash. So both of us are gonna be on the same install DNA. We are gonna be in an isolated community or better to say network that we can see each other, we can communicate each other, we can share the data totally in an isolated environment named network or community. Go to routes, um, mm -hmm. routes dashboard. Uh, dashboard JS, and at the bottom of this file, which is too big, um, uh, we have uh, we looked at it briefly in the last call. Right. Um, uh, both two two separate functions create project and join project. They both share this inner uh, call called install project app, which is directly above this. So install project act, app actually takes, um, uh, it takes in the secret phrase, which is called the passphrase. And it converts the passphrase to, to a UID. So we were just talking about what's, what is a UID. So, um, so the passphrase is a five, uh, five word string um, separated by spaces, happy, um, pig, cow, donkey, grass. Um, for example, um, that's what the passphrase is, converts it into a single string, which we can pass, uh, or a, a slightly modified version of the string um, that we can pass as a UID. And then um, we kind of look on line 272, we can kind of hop over um, some of that stuff on line 272. We just call for what is where is the where is that project's DNA, um, and then we take a step to register the DNA. So first of all, if we have this is at this particular version of Holochain, it varies version to version slightly, but um, but we call register DNA and we give it the path of the original DNA plus we call give it the UID that we've just defined based on our secret phrase. So now through this action. We've created this. Um, we haven't actually like installed it yet. So there's two separate stages. There's registering, and then there's in, then there's like installing the app, which actually like attaches an agent to a DNA. The first part is just to kind of almost get the conductor set up with the DNA, and the second part is to actually like um, 
open up a new source chain uh, based on that DNA, uh, based on the user or the agent key um, that we provide to install apps. So um, the first part is the part that handles the UID and creates a unique hash, um, line 275 called hash. Um, could be renamed like DNA hash. That is a hash of the unique DNA that's created by combining the project's DNA with this unique um, uh, UID, this unique identifier um, that's constructed from the secret. So now anyone who knows the secret uh, has this capability just based on this pattern. Anyone who knows the secret has this capability to join my project automatically. Um, uh, because it, like in theory, if they have the, uh, the right knowledge or they have Acorn same version installed, they put in the code and they're in. Right, so this, this would be akin to say in this uh, visualization, let's say that Burnett wants to create a project. So um, it's actually not cloning DNA in Acorn, but it would be uh eventually right so same app and and, and just cloning dna yeah so, could be, yeah yeah and this it's like would be... cloning without exactly using the word yeah. clone it's yeah, uh -huh. it's cloning conceptually um, yeah yeah so this would be my uh secret project pass phrase right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. pass phrase okay um yeah. so this is uh, you you said this as uid um, I'm going to ignore completely membrane proof for now. This is only needed for visualization mm -hmm. here. So, um, and now Bernet clones it and mm -hmm. she's the only one playing there. But at any point in time, if CV knows it for uh, with a chat or whatever and does mm -hmm. exactly the same and puts exactly the same UID, then mm -hmm. that's when the joining will, will occur. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Perfect. Connor, uh, mm -hmm. what is your recommendation? When designer and architect, it is good to think about using this pattern. Is there any pros and cons about this pattern? Hmm. Good question. Um, there is some uh, one one a factor that's a little bit unknown here is um, just in general about, okay, clone this, you know, let's say that for each chat, I wanted a separate DHT. Well, um, how exactly performant would it be on my computer if uh, over time I accumulated chats and at some point I have like 40 chats and so each of them is a separate DHT and is everything that's going on in Holochain optimized for all such 40 um, chats running simultaneously. Um, so there's the question of scale, how big, how big can this grow? And at which point of maturity, how, how optimized is, is, is everything for that in particular? How many cells can a holochain conductor run performantly. Um, these are things that we haven't really tested the upper limit of necessarily. Maybe hollow has to an extent. I'm not exactly sure what goes on. Um, uh, but yeah, if you just clone the DNA over and over and over again, then you got to know that you're accumulating DNAs and it takes resources to run each separate one. Um, that might be more than it takes to run the same one multiple things going on within the same one, different patterns of creating uh, privacy because it's mostly privacy preserving, right? This is mostly what you're dealing with is privacy preserving um, benefits. Uh, so there could be other ways that you could approach privacy preserving um, benefits. So that's all I can think of right now. Ian, do you think, do you, would you like to add extra about this pattern, when to use, pros and cons? Mm, about this pattern, I would like to see in the future how the membrane stuff evolves. 
um, also be uh, like that's uh, uh, also touching validation rules. Um, but this membrane proof um, concept is something that you uh, present at the beginning of your source chain to validate, to, to prove that you are able to enter in this DNA, right? Um, I would like to see how this evolves and what are the pros and cons, because in, in, in this way, only with the UUID, anyone who knows the UUID is able to enter, right? And maybe that's, that gets out, or maybe that, uh, I don't know, we, we, you, could, you could be trying to um, guess UUIDs on your uh, conductor, right? Uh, with a four, trying to clone DNAs, guessing names or guessing secret codes. And, and you would be able to, to join. So um, yeah, I, I, I want to see how that evolves and, and in the future, how, how this turns out to be. And from my part, I really would love to see one day we can export the DNA and attach DNA in another conductor. It means I can have my DNA working data inside. I can export it and go to another device or another place. I can attach this DNA as an exported DNA and bam, open a new device. Cool. Um, Connor, are we approaching? If I'm right, we are approaching time that you have to go. Yeah, yeah we would be approaching. Yeah, what can we, um, how do you want to kind of wrap up? So from my side, um, we barely touched the surface of uh, projects and it's that, that would be really interesting uh, for me. I don't know if you got gas for in the future doing a third part of ACORN. I'm finding this extremely valuable and interesting and it's always fun to, to, to have you here with us. So I don't know if, if you, like we can talk about this later also, but I, I would, be, would be amazing to have that. Maybe not, not next week or like when, mm -hmm, whenever, mm -hmm. whenever. It's, yeah, it's it can possible. be on a rolling. Yeah, can, we, can, we can certainly envision it for the, for the future. I'm very, I'm very happy, very open to that. Um, I would, yeah, I'd, I'd love to as well. Um, uh, It'd be cool just to like touch on not like the specifics or like really any detail, but really just to like point at one or two things in the project structure or folder, just to kind of provide a viewer with um, uh, with situated knowledge, um, uh, as well as yourself, Gam. If you do any further reading, that kind of thing. So. Um, uh, yeah, I'll just point at folder structure, roughly something like that there for a minute, which is um, Fol folder structure or a ah, file ah. structure, file structure. Yeah, the files itself. We're just looking at it right now. Yeah, exactly. So um, like in general, there's a folder for each entry mm -hmm. type, right? Um, and um, yeah, I want to make some very high level comment, which is that um, I strove to find ways to um, to minimize, obviously, the total number of lines of code. And um, one of the slightly crazy ways that I found to do this, which I, I, I didn't necessarily know how to do it a different way, was that um, it, um, it's kind of an advanced topic in Rust, but the idea of macros. So um, there's this weird thing in Acorn where um, uh, I just wanted basic functions for that basically followed the, 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 con the typical pattern of create, read, update, and delete. So for every data structure that you see here, there's like, say, uh, not, not every single one, but the majority of them, except for member and project meta, I think. Um, maybe even those ones. No, everything except member. Everything except member um, uses something, you can take a peek at it, um, called this CRUD um, macro. Look for CRUD, okay. So this macro is in each of them and it expands this huge chunk of code that basically stands for create, read, update, delete. 
and it implements automatically a consistent pattern of create, read, update, and delete for, uh, for each entry type that we define. So there's basically like a very, and it comes from the DNA help crate. We don't, um, we don't need to look at it, but basically the idea is you call CRUD and that, 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 um, that uh, exclamation point, and it expands that code and um, fills it in automatically with a consistent pattern for zone functions for create, read, update, and delete. So this was a way of minimizing total lines of source code. It ends up, um, I would say, slightly affecting negatively the readability of the code um, or the kind of sense making of it uh, for an external reader. So that's why I wanted to point to it because it's like, how does this all work? Um, uh, so, so that's, that's one of the major things and, um, crud is defined in the DNA help thing. I guess you can pop to it for, for a second, um, Guillaume. Uh, it's down at the bottom. It's this big macro macro rules crud that basically fills in each of those with this, um, with this boilerplate, it's basically like boilerplate um, stuff. And it handles some stuff to do with the entry types. And then it creates a create function and a fetch function and an update function and a delete function. So um, it, a lot of the core logic is implemented there and it's generalized uh, for each of the different data structures. So this would be, a very advanced thing to kind of look at. Um, as I said, it kind of negatively affects the readability, I think, but, um, but also in theory, people could potentially benefit from this a lot if they wanted to just import a thing and call crud and get their zone functions. It's not really there yet. It's not that usable. It's not that self-explanatory or anything, but that's what's that's what's going on. That's what's like under the hood of Acorn in the projects, um, uh, in the projects DNA. So, um, and it handles pretty much everything like signals. Um, all the signals are handled here. Uh, most, a lot of the core logic in this one macro that just reuses itself for all the different entry types. So, um, and then the other thing is just to point at validation and the general patterns of validation in each entry type. So within a specific folder, actually go to like goal vote, for example. So goal vote, the folder. So goal vote has CRUD and it has validate. And that's the basic separation. CRUD defines the zone functions and validate defines the validation callbacks for the entry types. So you can see CRUD is actually super minimal. Um, a lot of the, the code and the logic relating to a goal vote, and this is true with all of them. So just take what I'm saying and, and you'll see it's the same all across the board for all these entry types, um, is that we run this uh, validation over the create actions and the update actions and the delete actions. And that validation is unit tested. And there's an article on how to do that unit testing that I can share in the description. So um, yeah, this is the unit. This is the unit tests half, uh, the unit test half of it. Um, a lot of the lines of code in this file are the, are the unit testing. It's, um, it's not simple, but it's also, um, I found it's quite, it's fast to test and it's also very well integrated. Um, it's very convenient in a certain, certain sense for a mid-level Rust developer um, to, to use uh, the, uh, the, valid, the uh, unit testing in Rust versus Triorama. So it's different, different benefits uh, to and from Triorama, like different pros and cons. To that but you'll just see that yeah that the pattern is consistent in each so there's validation rules in each of the the entry types 
um, this same yeah, yeah. basic thing. It's like you have a validate function, you have how, what are the validation rules, and then you have a set of unit tests um, that cover those validation rules. Does it do what it's supposed to? And then last of all, if you want to just like step away from code and you want to see what, what are all these validation rules trying to accomplish, there's a .txt file um, uh, in the project, yeah, uh, which basically defines human readable version of the uh, what what are the validation rules that have been programmed into those each specific entry type based on the entry structure and this was how I went about it I wrote it in English you know I wrote it out first um, and then I went in to uh, to tackle it kind of one one by one so this shows you for example you know a delete action for a goal is allowed by anyone that's the rule that's what I'm trying to accomplish um, or update who should be able to update that's a key piece of logic create anybody can obviously create but what are the rules when you're creating are there any rules um, and that's a basic pattern that you can follow that anyone can follow when thinking through validation rules is um, who should be able to create what are the rules around updating something in particular you know is this wikipedia or is this my or is this something else is this kind of like uh very personalized um types of content um and, and it's quite interesting to think it through actually thinking through it has quite big implications um you know for example goal member is basically the idea of someone being assigned to something so can i can can gm assign me to something or can only i assign me to something um maybe i that's i think um well in acorn anybody can assign any of their peers to something and we don't really call it a sign we call it just member uh they're associated with it but uh but yeah depending on your project that could feel um you don't that, that those are important rules that you're building in and you want to build it into validation not zoom calls because zoom calls aren't Zoom calls aren't privacy or security. Only validation rules are privacy and security. And that's something that people don't get about Holochain soon enough, typically, is that only validation rules um, act as, as security in your DNA because, um, because it's executed against any data that lands on your computer. And so obviously, uh, that's the point at which you want to be encoding security is um, you don't you essentially want to distrust any data that comes to you over the network and that's what the validation rules allow you to do that amazing. is great amazing yeah yeah can be because i i, I know this we are running up the time so would you please come back and i can share my screen because the validation rule we never talked about i really would like to cover thank you connor because i, I was wondering i hope we are not gonna end it up without validation rule but mm -hmm. let's do it actually quick what is validation rule we, we didn't think about actually the the this 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 topic before so in the central in in the single source in the centralized world that we already live in the validation rules are mostly uh, it's centralized it means in a twitter example if you do a tweet it is the server the application which is hosted in the server or servers distributed no matter they are going to check that how long your tweet is and it is allowed or not but in the distributed dht when the community install one application all of them are running the same application with the same business rules like a dna cloning if you remember so just imagine these these people as a community inside the one network they clone the same dna it means they are running the same piece of code it means they are running the same 
piece of business rule or a validation rule. Mm -hmm. So we are calling wow. them. Hadaya. Yes. What if mm -hmm. the one that you've clicked on mm -hmm. uh, learned somehow from mm -hmm. the green person mm -hmm. the hash of mm -hmm. the DNA? Mm -hmm. The hash of the DNA on which all these people are playing, what if they don't actually have the real um, source code? And they, so they can, essentially, they have the hash, which is basically, think of it as a key to mm -hmm. the DHT, mm -hmm. uh, or one layer of the key. There could be different layers of keys, but, mm -hmm. but that the hash that everyone else is playing on could be the simplest form of key. Uh, to, into, to which you need to provide in order to join the game. Mm -hmm. And so if the blue person only has the hash, in theory, if they were a, if they were a highly technical mm -hmm. user, this kind of the so-called bad actor scenario mm -hmm. is, is that um, they're a highly technical user who doesn't have a copy of the source code. However, they got the hash uh, from, from someone else or somehow they got it offline uh, or something, they received it. Uh, it's all that they need to gain access in a way to the network, just to mm -hmm. the network. So now, now that they have the hash, they could start making up whatever, whatever source code they want as the rules of their own private game. Uh, mm -hmm. And they can still talk to all the other players because they're impersonating someone who's playing a legitimate uh, who's playing legitimately by the rules just mm -hmm. by having the, the hash, if the hash leaked, for mm -hmm. example, which the hash could easily leak. Mm -hmm. It's just a string. So um, so the question is, this person gets onto the network and other people generally, they accept them as being a valid actor on the, on the network. They basically assume good intent, maybe at first, at first glance, right? They assume that the blue person because they're here they must be playing by all the same rules as the rest of us right just the fact that they're here means that they are but that's not entirely true all that they needed was the hash which is the key and they could have opened the door to my network so so the the potential the the risk uh the the threat vector here is is that this person claims to be playing by the same rules of the game but as everyone else but but isn't actually, they have free access to modify their own personal source code mm -hmm. for their own rules of the game, subject mm -hmm. to however they want. So let's say they start deciding to um, spread the, to spread data that would sort of, data that's according to a different set of rules, they'd start spreading it around the network. They start um, through the gossip protocol, they start, spreading it to the other, other peers. Those peers are, they can either be secure or insecure. And whether their level of security depends on whether they implemented those validation callbacks. Because um, if they didn't implement the validation callbacks, basic, basically what you're saying is that you just, you trust everyone who's on the network completely completely. You have, if you have no validation rules, you just say, I give blanket trust to everybody on the network. You know what? Because for some reason, that's, that's an okay level of security for me um, or in this network context or application context. But for people whom that might not be acceptable, which is probably most people, um, you really want to have those implemented such that all the other players are going to actually, when they get data gossiped to them over the network, they're going to double check it. They're going to say, I know about the rules of this game. And does this data that I'm getting gossiped to me over the network comply with the rules of the game according to me, according to how I know them to be, which is the most important thing. Um, and basically that's what it's doing. It's saying, it's saying yes, they do, or no, they don't. Um, something about this data, somehow or other, this person, I don't know whether it was bad intent or somehow they corrupted something or uh, whatever, by whatever means, they ended up passing me data that doesn't comply with my version of the rules. And that's when I start to get suspicious and I start to maybe fire up the so-called immune system of holochain or that kind of thing, which is, which is how do we go about dealing with people? And it's not built, it's not, holochain 
won't necessarily be super dogmatic about what's going to be your approach. Um, it's going to allow you some options. Uh, they're not all there yet. All the options aren't really there, but but that's the idea is that it allows you options on how to um, how to react against uh, data that comes to you and you say and and uh, it doesn't like pass your validation. So yeah, it's funny when you're looking at that thing and we assume that everyone um, you know on the network, uh, of course, we would think that it's um, yeah, it's just important. That's basically the threat vector, I guess. Fantastic. Thank you, Connor. Actually, you explain everything I, I wanted to explain. Signal <laughs> world, immune system of the community, it's validation rules. It means validation rules, taking care uh, of the data that propagated among the peers. That's it. If somebody as a bad actor is going to escape the rule and propagate the data, which was not passed through validation rule. Other peers application are gonna rule, are gonna run the validation rule and detect that, hey, hey, you are sending the data, which is not valid. Then mm -hmm. the network is gonna make a decision to what to do with you. Temporary <laughs> exactly. blocked or blocked or totally blocked. It exactly. depends and it is not already fully implemented, but all in all, the best place you can find the validation rule right now, implemented, tested with the scenario. Also, Connor and Acorn project. Thank you, Connor. And also, because of the flow, I highly recommend go to forum.holochain.org and find the validation rule article. And the article Connor mentioned about, he was thinking what was the issue, and he found out the issue because of the flow that when you submit entry so there is a flow update submit when the validation rule is running you need to know how the flow of the actually how the flow that the validation yeah. apply that's it i highly highly it recommend is. look at the article and the example code of validation rule inside the acon project that's it mm. nice it, it's thank you, Connor, to because we we never opened the talk about the validation rule, and it is really fantastic that we opened it right now. Yeah. So, and with a real example, with your beautiful explanation. However, I'm sure Gim can also expand it with the gym, Polychain gym. But I think we are running out of the time for another time. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I would. I would. Um echo the idea that understanding the flow of the validation is the, is the, the key, especially um, the fact that um, it's sort of two-sided in the sense that validation can actually be used to validate your own things as you're authoring your source chain, but also it's used to validate uh, incoming data incoming over the network. So it sort of serves two purposes and that can be sort of confusing or be a gotcha because it's like, well, what's the context that you call validation? And then there's actually at least two separate contexts um, uh, that are very related, but um, have slightly different behaviors. So that that still needs more documentation, that kind of thing. So yeah. Yeah, thanks, Hadaya. Thanks, Guillaume. It was really fun to have, have you driving, Guillaume. And uh, yeah. Thank so, you. Uh, it yes. honestly, like so much. <laughs> yes, thank you, Connor. As I mentioned at the beginning, we are targeting 45 minutes, but we are ending up around two hours. That's <laughs> not in the game. <laughs> so sorry, it is not a trick. It is happening organically, actually. <laughs> so thank you to anybody join, especially Guillaume. And I think it is better for me that... Connor, is there anything remaining you would like to mention? Oh, please. Um... Let's see. Just um, yeah, you, people, I, I'm I'm really looking forward to kind of more engagement in general uh, with people about Acorn, understanding um, readability uh, it from a readability point of view. Uh, what I think I'm already just thinking through some things, having talked about this, about um, that. Also, if 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 you if you end up having ideas about like 
libraryization or something like where it's like which parts could we pull uh, and sort of make almost into a library, in which case it would be a natural pathway towards documenting it and making it kind of reusable, that kind of thing. So if, if those come up as ideas, that'd be cool. Um, uh, there's stuff that could eventually be gone into, uh, well, yeah, we, we think maybe maybe later uh, in a couple of weeks or, or whenever we can do another something. Um, but uh, yeah, just feedback. I guess what I'm asking for is feedback. Feedback will be great uh, coming out of these sessions. I love that. So. so thank you for your time, for your presence and uh, before before wrapping up this session as a recording session, we can a little bit continue. I think we need to do more chat with our friends here. Kian, please wrap it up this session and the last word from you. From me, see you next time. Kian? <laughs> no, this has been absolutely uh, lovely. I think there is so much uh, going on in the ecology and development community and we are trying to share it between share learnings be, be there for each other and it really feels it feels really valuable not only from the technical side and so on but uh like you connor coming here and we chatting about how you made Acorn, like it's it's fantastic and the, and the way that you are open about it and want to explain uh like i really value that so thanks for that and thank you for uh all all of you here and i am sure that more will come because like these these videos are extremely valuable like it's it's very very high level so yeah thanks all for for that and and see you next time also yeah thanks yeah. thank you very much see connor and Kim and Hidayat. Yeah, that's great yeah bye bye thanks uh, nice to see you good to see you